course, that's impossible to do inside of an ETF or inside of a mutual fund because you really have no control over what stock that manager buys. Yeah, exactly right. And you're in that vehicle with other people as well, and their actions can affect the returns that you receive. When it's wrapped up together, then it's really all the same thing. So really stripping that away lets us really dial this in and become a truly customized solution to the client's unique uh, wants and needs. Starting your route to retirement. Welcome to the Guided Retirement Show. I'm your host, Dean Barber, Managing Director of Modern Wealth Management, coming to you from the Modern Wealth Management Studios in Kansas City. Today, I have special guest Stephen Tuckwood, a.k.a. Tuck. He is a chartered financial analyst, and he is the Director of Investments here at Modern Wealth Management. Tuck and I will be discussing tax-efficient investing today, and more directly, we're going to be talking about direct indexing and custom indexing. Please enjoy my conversation with Tuck. Before we hop into today's episode, I want to remind our listeners and viewers that you can access the same financial planning tools we use for our own clients on your own time and all from the comfort of your own home. All you need to do is visit the link in the show notes and click the start planning button. From there, you can start building your retirement plan, no cost, no obligation. All right, Stephen Tuckwood, a.k.a. Tuck, Director of Investments, Modern Wealth Management, and also a chartered financial analyst. You're right here on the Guided Retirement Show for your second time. Welcome, Tuck. Good to see you. Thanks, Dean. Good to be back. So we're going to talk about tax-efficient investing today. And you know that's a big deal when we think about people and money that is invested that is not inside of retirement accounts. Taxes can be a pretty wealth-eroding factor, and it can take away from the total return. And so we're here today to talk about tax-efficient investing and something that is fairly new to the retail investor or the average investor, not the ultra high net worth. And we're going to talk about something called direct indexing. And I want you to start out, Tuck, by giving us a little bit of a history on direct indexing and kind of the the theory behind it, where did it, where did it come from and why? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, Dean. It's, it's been around for a long time, um, mostly used by ultra high net worth folks and institutions. So that kind of echelon of investor. And uh, thanks to some advancements in technology, but mostly advancements in the loan of trading costs, it's really now a very useful tool for um, average investors to utilize. And, and like you say, uh, protecting returns against uh, the erosion of taxes is important. And we want our folks to really keep as, as much of they earn as possible. So uh, really looking to do things in a tax efficient way. So, um, you know, that's the big thing. Um, it's now become one of the fastest growing parts of the general marketplace as we look at investment solutions. And um, like I say, it's really down to the fact that trading costs have come down practically to zero. If you're with a discount brokerage firm, um, a lot of zero percent trading costs. So um, back in the days when it was a $50 ticket charge for a buy or sell of a security, um, that's what made it, you, you know, reserved really for those ultra high net worth folks where that's proportionally not a lot of money. So Right. And um, we still even see today though, Tuck, that a lot of the providers of direct indexing have pretty high minimum account balances, like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And so um, that's coming down. There are a few out there that are less than that, but that's kind of the average that you see is a minimum account balance. Um, and I think people all understand why there's a higher minimum once we really kind of unwrap what this whole direct indexing is. And I use the term unwrap because I think that's the way you like to describe the the direct indexing is you're unwrapping the mutual fund or you're unwrapping the ETF. So explain that a little bit if you could. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's in the name. I like to just break it down into the two parts, direct and indexing. So we think about direct, it's the investor owns each of the underlying positions directly. So each so stock. No longer each each stock. stock. Yep. Um, so that appears directly in their brokerage statement because they own each one of those directly. So in other words, there's no ETF or mutual fund wrapper around those you know, hundreds of positions. We were stripping that down and investing in these positions directly. The second part of the name is indexing in that we 
initially select an index to track towards. Um, so combine those two things together and that's it, your direct indexing solution. And so when you're seeking to mirror an index, how closely will this direct indexing match that index? Yeah, within uh, very tightly. And it depends on a few things. But um, if you were to fund the account with cash, that gives the direct index provider the uh, most ability to track closest. Um, if you were to fund the account with positions of highly appreciated stocks, then the manager has to work around some of those over time to get the tracking a lot tighter to that benchmark. So it depends on a few things and it depends on if you're adding a lot of customization to that index, um, that then it'll deviate a little bit more. But yeah, the idea is really to get really close to that index over time. You know, there's been a lot uh, in the news talk about ESG uh, and the like. Uh, there are also, um, you know, some investors who may be adverse to uh, alcohol, tobacco, maybe averse to abortion. They may have religious beliefs. How customized can an individual get? In in other words, if we're going to track, we'll just use the S and P five hundred index as an example. If we want to track the S and P five hundred index, and we want to do it directly, is the end investor able to look at the underlying socks and say, "I don't want X Y Z company in." my portfolio because I disagree with whatever it is about that company. Yep, exactly right. So you can write at inception of the strategy. We go through an intake form where we're going through the investors own values and beliefs. And um, sometimes it's, they might work for uh, an S and P 500 company or a company that's in the index and they might have a lot of that stock held elsewhere that they don't want to be investing in that in this particular place. So we could uh, make sure that that's never included in the opportunity set. Um, but really we can tailor that uh, as much or as little as we like. That's perfect. I, Cause I think there's a lot of people out there that if they knew that they could do that, that they would be doing that. And of course that's impossible to do inside of an ETF or inside of a mutual fund, because you really have no control over what stock that manager buys. Yeah, exactly right. And you're in that vehicle with other people as well, and their actions can affect the returns that you receive. And uh, and yeah, it's all, when it's wrapped up together, then it's really all the same thing. So really stripping that away lets us really dial this in and become a truly customized solution to the client's unique uh, wants and needs. So we're talking about kind of the structure of direct indexing and some of the benefits. But when we started the program today, we said we're going to talk about tax efficient investing. So what makes direct indexing tax efficient? Yeah, well, first of all, you own each position directly. So that means you own your own cost basis in each and every position. And that can go down all the way to the lot level. So let's say you own 100 shares of Apple. Well, you might have bought that in two pieces, two chunks. So you could have a batch of, of 50 and then another batch of 50 with a different cost basis. And when it comes time to sell some Apple, you, you want to be really selecting the tax lot that's more favorable to you. So that allows us really to get that minute when it comes to uh, deciding on what to sell and how. Um, but in general, the... Uh, the tax loss harvesting program that can be applied on top of a direct indexing program is really one of the key benefits to this. So we can obviously do this inside of a qualified account where taxes aren't a consideration and really track a benchmark and customize. But once we move into a taxable account, this tax overlay becomes a really powerful tool. And just at a high level, what's going on is where we're tracking an index, let's just say the S&P 500, just being a, a large one. We're not actually buying every position, all 500 stocks in those proportional weights. What we're doing is buying a few hundred of them, leaving room to replace some of those positions that might have a, a loss at any particular time. So let's say there's a Pepsi that goes down. That's one of the positions that you happen to own at that time. 
so it's, it's going down for whatever reason, we can harvest that loss, book the loss, make it realized, and then replace it with Coca-Cola, which is a similar risk return profile as Pepsi, and keep the exposure the same, keep the tracking tight to the index, but having harvested that loss along the way. So imagine doing that over and over again with all the positions in the portfolio. All right. I think you've got a chart that we want to show here on the tax loss harvesting and the tax impact that it can have over time. All right. So we've got a chart pulled up here. And for those of you that are listening to the Guided Retirement Show via podcast, you can also find the Guided Retirement Show on YouTube so that you can actually see the chart that Tuck and I are going to go through. So walk us through this chart, Tuck. Yeah. So this is just a, a hypothetical example. It's not real, but it's just here to emphasize the point of um, what might happen in an account. So on the left-hand side, we have an account that has a starting value of $100,000 at the beginning of the year. It invests in the market in general, let's say the S&P 500. So, an, so and, like an ETF. Mm -hmm, yep. A standard ETF or however else you might uh, invest there normally. Um, the, the market has a good year. We're up 20%, so we've made $20,000. That gives us an end value of 120. But if you were to want, if you wanted to liquidate that position for whatever reason and, and use that money, then you'd have to pay tax on those gains. Um, and that's what the uh, representation is there, that there's been a haircut after that that the tax man has taken. Compare that to the right-hand side, which is the same exposure, the same performance, but within a tax harvesting strategy where we've been able to harvest losses along the way, so throughout the year. And in this case, we've able to realize and capture $20,000 of losses. Well, we end up with a $20,000 gain because we have the same returns as the benchmark over time, but we have those losses booked that we could offset in the event that we wanted to liquidate that position. So um, just a really great benefit. Now, they're not always going to equal each other, the gains and the losses. But the point is, uh, there's an additional benefit, an additional attempt to um, in increase value by actively harvesting losses throughout time, which you just wouldn't get with an S&P 500 ETF or a mutual fund. So you're, you're combining then the direct indexing, the owning of the individual securities with the tax loss harvesting, and that's what creates the tax efficient investing. Exactly right. Yep. And another thing I want to point out here, Tuck, and you might want to speak to this a little bit, is ETFs are more tax friendly than most mutual funds because in mutual funds, you can have something called a phantom gain. And that phantom gain can come from a position that that fund manager might have bought three, four, five, six years ago that has a lot of appreciation. Then they sell it because it's become too large of a position or they don't like it anymore. And then you have a gain in that stock inside of a mutual fund that until this point has just simply pushed up the price per share. But when that gain is realized inside the fund, then there's a capital gain distribution to the client, but the share price drops by the same amount as the capital gain distribution. So they have to pay taxes on something that they didn't get any benefit for unless they owned that mutual fund for the entire time. Yeah, that's right. And um, it's, uh, it's not a nice thing at all to if you've ever gone through that. If there's been a down year in your fund that you've got into and um, there's been a, a tax bill at the end of it. So um, yeah, very, uh, not particularly uh, tax friendly is the mutual fund, mutual fund structure in general to investors. And just a reminder that you're, you're in that fund with other people, you're, you're sharing that vehicle. So if they, if you're in there with a large investor and they redeem throughout a bad year and you're sticking with it, that's when those phantom gains often occur is when there's a big proportional movement out of the fund that you're in. I think that that's, uh, that's amazing. So there's other benefits here to the direct indexing and in that, you know, tax optimized withdrawals or tax optimized charitable giving. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, it really gets back to the point of owning your own cost basis in each underlying position um, defined by the particular lot. Um, so a lot of times when we think about charitable giving and um, we look at highly appreciated stock and we just automatically 
choose the most highly appreciated position in your portfolio and, and give that to charity. And there's, there's benefits around that rather than selling it yourself um, and then giving cash. So it, th- that same concept applies, but as we're choosing what to gift, um, we were taking into consideration not only the appreciated portion of it, but how does it affect the rest of the portfolio and how that tracks to the benchmark. So it might be that uh, in a more optimized manner, it might be a position that's not that obvious that we'd be gifting that amount to because, again, our objectives along the way is to really reduce um, tracking versus uh, or, or reduce tracking error or increase tracking in general to that index. Um, so a more of a thoughtful approach than just the, the straight gifting of your most highly appreciated stock. And because it is individual positions and it is down to the account level for each individual client, it's all it's all their own. So they are not doing this with anybody else. So they really get to have far more control than what they would were they selling an ETF or they gifting a mutual fund or whatever. It's this is this is way better. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think control is is a great word. You mentioned something earlier, Tuck, and uh, we'll throw up another chart here in just a second, but you mentioned something earlier where uh, you said somebody might work for one of the companies in the S&P 500, or perhaps they've bought a stock and they've got a highly appreciated and it's a, it's a good chunk of their portfolio. How does the direct indexing manage around that and how does that benefit the individual client? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, a lot of situations we see that, um, yeah, either somebody works for a, a publicly traded company or they have a position or a few that are just highly appreciated. So they got into something really early. They did fantastically well. But now it's become a disproportionately large portion of their portfolio. And what we know is that we want to be generally diversified. So how do we work that position down or work around it? Um, the old way of doing things was really just to segregate that position, hold it in a different account, and then continue to manage the other portion of the portfolio as we would. Um, But with direct indexing, what you're able to do is recognize that you have that position and that exposure within the portfolio, and then optimize the other positions that we're purchasing around it. So if it's a technology name, then our exposure to other technology companies might not be as high in the general portfolio to offset that exposure. Um, so a really great way of just taking a holistic picture and bringing portfolio management all together rather than having this kind of segregated concept where we're just recognizing that it's there but not able to manage around it effectively. Yeah, and again, the chart here you have Tuck is really good. So for those of you again listening on podcast, join us on YouTube and you'll be able to see the chart that Tuck's talking about here. So Tuck, I want to talk just briefly about equal weighting versus cap weighting. And you know, you, you look at the S&P 500 index and the pure index it's it's cap weighted, right? So it's based on the capitalization, the size of each company and how much of the index they make up. And is, is there benefit so can you do both you could do cap weighted. Could you do equal weighted? Could you go to say a NASDAQ 100 index? Could you use the Dow 30? What are the limits here on what a person can actually do if they want to take advantage of this direct indexing strategy? If there's an index, then it can be tracked as, as, as basic as that. But um, the, uh, you know, I'd always raise some caution in terms of which are you choosing? You need to be comfortable with the risk profile of that particular index. So, you know, I wouldn't encourage folks to get too kind of minute or in a particular corner of the market, but just broadly speaking, any of these broad indices you could opt to, uh, to track against. Uh, I think that's fantastic. So we've talked about a lot of the benefits we've talked about, you know, personalization, every investor can do it. You can choose your index, you can restrict positions and you can reflect your personal values and beliefs in, in what you own. And you get the tax loss harvesting. So you're keeping more of your money. You're keeping money away from uncle Sam and, and keeping it in your pocket. And, um, you know, so, so I think we, there's a lot of benefits, but with, as with everything, there has to be, some drawbacks. So talk us through what might be 
a drawback on the direct indexing? Yeah, so owning in each position, we're talking hundreds here. So if your statements come through the mail, um, you're going to get a lot more pages, pages and pages. And um, if you you know didn't recognize that going into this, that might come as a little bit of a surprise. Um, so we'd encourage folks just to recognize that that would be the case and to uh, maybe elect for email or electronic statements at that point. Um, the other would be trade confirmations. So like we said, there's a ongoing tax loss harvesting uh, throughout the year. So there are going to be initial trades up front measured in the hundreds if you're um, funding this with cash. And then throughout the year, as this system looks to really track and optimize to that index, there's going to be trades, but also on the tax loss harvesting side as well. So trade confirms if you get those email alerts every time there's a change in your account, then you might want to turn those off as well. Um, so those are the two kind of bigger drawbacks here, but um, it's generally a positive story. Yeah, no, I think that I could suppress confirm statements and take email delivery for the obvious benefits of direct indexing. So I think from what we've talked about, and I know we're not going to talk specifically about price, but I know people have to be wondering, okay, how does the expense of direct indexing compare to mutual funds and ETFs? Can we talk broadly about that? Yeah, broadly speaking, it's a lot less than an active mutual fund. Um, and around, a, you know, it's not a, a rock bottom fee in terms of what we're seeing in some of these ETFs, um, but it's very, very reasonable on average in the marketplace um, for, you know, what is such a compelling strategy. Um, and, and I guess that's the other thing to really contemplate here is that um, the index you choose is really the, the key decision up front because that's the risk return profile that you're going to be receiving in general. So making sure you're comfortable with the size of that allocation and that particular index that you're tracking to. But in terms of price, it's really competitive um, and uh, comparable with a lot of the ETFs out there. Yeah, and, I, and, it, and it depends on the provider of this strategy too. So there's there's a, a handful of advice. Uh, 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 there's a handful of companies out there that are providing the direct indexing strategy, and they all have slightly different pricing. Yeah. Just That's like right. just like all the mutual funds and ETFs have slightly different pricing, but you know, if you speak with an advisor, they'll be able to actually clearly define what those costs are. Yep, exactly right. So at the end of the day, Tuck, what you've said and what I know about direct indexing, it's not a surprise that you're seeing more and more of this and this being one of the fastest growing sectors of the equity indexing. Um, or equity investing, I should say, a portion of a client's portfolio. And I think once more people really understand it and learn what it is, they'll be asking for it far more than they're asking for the individual ETFs or the mutual funds. And I see this kind of like when the ETFs were originally introduced, they really started, it, it was a slow run, but it started kind of putting some pressure on the actively managed mutual funds. And now you even have actively managed ETFs. And so the ETF market has, you know, grown substantially while the mutual fund uh, area has actually shrunk a little bit. Um, so especially valuable in taxable accounts, but still for the customization for the person that wants to invest based on their values and they want to be transparent, they want to understand what they own. It still works well within retirement accounts as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, application here, for sure. All right. Anything else you want to add on direct indexing and the tax efficiency of it, Tuck? No, I mean, it's just, uh, we, we believe it's just a great solution in a lot of use cases. And um, we've just kind of really scratched the surface in terms of application. Once we get into some more complicated tax situations and the like, where we've got a tax professional helping us, uh, you can really do some great things um, with this approach. Well, and what I would tell everybody is that you're working with the CFP here at Modern Wealth and working along with Tuck as the CFA and Director of Investments and our CFP or CPAs, the tax professionals, you combine those three together and 
really customize this to what each individual wants, um, I think some pretty magical things really start to happen. Yep. All right. Well, Tuck, thanks for being part of the Guided Retirement Show again. I'll be excited to have you on again. I hope everybody has enjoyed our discussion around tax-efficient investing and more particularly direct indexing. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dean. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Tuck and our discussion on tax-efficient investing and more, more importantly, even direct indexing and custom indexing so that your investing matches your values. Thanks for joining me. We know if you're listening to the Guided Retirement Show that you have questions about investing, taxes, whatever it may be, financial. You can find a link in the show notes where you can send us those questions and we'll get answers to you. Don't forget, we're offering you access to the same financial planning tools we use for our own clients. Just get out to the link in the show notes and click the Start Planning button and begin your retirement plan from the comfort of your own home. Starting your route to retirement. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to leave a comment and share this episode with your friends. Investment advisory services offered through Modern Wealth Management, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor.